So I'm going to talk about vitamin A deficiency and um, clinical disease, as um, indicated in my title. And the reason why I'm interested in this topic is uh, because of my, my time in Haiti. I'm going to talk about one of the children that I met um, who lives in one of the shelters that SP had built who actually had um, manifestation of vitamin A deficiency. And I'll talk a little about it in a little um, further on in the presentation. So first of all, why is vitamin A deficiency um, a big issue? Um, it's a major public health challenge in the developing world, and it's defined by serum retinal concentrations that are less than 0.7 micromole per liter or abnormal conjunctival cytology with um, xerophthalmia. And I'm going to define what xerophthalmia is later on. So WHO estimates that 20 million pregnant women and 140 to about 250 million children under 5 have vitamin A deficiency. It is also associated with 1 million unnecessary deaths worldwide and is a leading cause of preventable blindness in the world. Given all this, um, you can see why it's such a major public health challenge. It's something that is easily preventable by supplementation and yet leads to um, death, blindness, and other, and other conditions, which I will discuss in a, little, in a while. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about vitamin A. It is a, an essential nutrient. Um, it's considered to be, so vitamin A deficiency is considered to be a micronutrient deficiency, and sometimes that is term, um, that term is actually, um, the term used to describe micronutrient deficiencies, hidden hunger, because you don't always see a, a manifestation of um, deficiency, micronutrient de deficiencies until it's very late. Um, so vitamin A is a subclass of retinoic acids. It's also lipid soluble. And so, a long time ago, ancient Egyptians recognized that night blindness, which is a manifestation of vitamin A deficiency, could be treated by consumption of liver. It so happens that um, vitamin A is found in the liver. And finally, in the, in the late 1920s, vitamin A was isolated um, and actually given the term vitamin A by um, an individual whose name is Evie McCollum, and his picture is right there. Um, and he did this work at Hopkins. And if you walk down the, the hallways at the School of Public Health, there is a portrait of him. So let's look at this map. This map shows us a distribution of vitamin A deficiency worldwide. So as you can tell, um, it's primarily located in um, Southeast Asia, most of Africa, as well as um, um, South America, South and Central America. So in the dark here, so you have areas that have a vitamin A deficiency that's greater than 15%, and the X represents xerophthalmia, which is a um, ocular manifestation of vitamin A deficiency um, that's greater than 1.5%. So um, as you can tell, areas in the Horn of Africa, um, so Angola, Zambia, as well as South Africa, all these areas, including um, India, have a vitamin A deficiency prevalence that's greater than 15%, but also have um, a prevalence of xerophthalmia that's greater than 1.5%. So other areas in Africa, including DRC, um, Uganda, Zimbabwe, Madagascar, um, you have Algeria, sorry, um, Libya, Morocco. Um, these areas actually have a vitamin A deficiency of greater than 15% or xerophthalmia that's greater than 1.5%. And what, 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 what do you notice by this? So it's actually very prevalent in the developing world, and I want to talk about why that's the case. So diets in the developing world depend on um, provitamin A or beta carotene, and that's actually a per precursor to vitamin A. And the conversion of provitamin A beta carotene to vitamin A in the gut is very, very limited. Therefore, um, you don't have high vitamin A content in um, diets um, among individuals that live in the developing world. So it's also um, very high among families that cannot afford to, um, to purchase eggs and dairy products. And this is a common theme as you look at um, the diet of individuals that are, that are living in, in the developing world. Therefore, 
the prevalence of vitamin A deficiency is extremely high. Um, you have preformed vitamin A that only provides 30% of all dietary vitamin A activity, and therefore individuals can only receive one-sixth of all their vitamin A, um, a content. And that's why um, vitamin A deficiency is so prevalent in the developing world. So there is another population um, that um, is extremely uh, vitamin A deficient, and they're individuals that are affected by humanitarian emergencies. And the reason why I bring this up is because ST is involved um, in a lot in responding to disasters. And um, as you think about individuals that are involved in um, disasters or affected by disasters, you want to think about some of the um, illnesses and diseases that, um, that might affect them. So why, why is it a problem? Um, when you have humanitarian emergencies, um, you have an increase in micronutrient deficiencies. So at baseline already, we looked at looking at that map, you notice that vitamin A deficiency is already prevalent in a lot of developing countries. And unfortunately, a lot of these countries, um, when they're affected by disasters, require foreign aid, they require um, NGOs um, to respond. And so you have an, an increase from baseline um, in micronutrient deficiencies, but especially vitamin A. Um, and the reason why this is is because um, there's decreased food availability overall. Um, you have disrupted local markets. If you have a disaster, a natural disaster, an area that's affected by conflict, um, local markets that used to exist no longer exist. And people are unable to um, purchase fruits and vegetables, eggs, dairy products. Um, you have growing, so growing vegetables and fruits is limited by land and water availability. Um, these countries are typically um, characterized by low prevalence of breastfeeding. And unfortunately, um, clinical manifestations represent late stage, so micronutrient deficiencies are present but not always always recognized. And that's that's an issue because I think as people receive food rations, um, micronutrients such as vitamin A and others are not necessarily always provided. So let's look at um, this study. This is a study that was done in 2005. And it looked at both iron and vitamin A deficiency among um, children that were six months to 59 months, so children under five. And they looked at various refugee camps in these countries, so Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, and Algeria. They found that iron deficiency was greater than 60% in three of these camps. Vitamin A deficiency was greater than 50% in um, three camps. But also, um, it's important to note that vitamin A supplementation was only found to be um, 3 to 67 percent, which is pretty low. Let's look at a daily ration that um, refugees typically receive. So this is composed of oil, 25 grams of oil, legumes, um, 50 grams of legumes, and um, 400 grams of cereal. What do you think the vitamin A content um, is? Is it high or low? Say low. Yeah. Low. Okay. Um, and that's right. If you look at the micronutrient content in terms of um, just, um, I guess, the daily content of rations with and without fortified blended food, if you look here at this first column here, so there's zero vitamin A in cereal, oil, B, or beans. So when refugees receive rations, they receive no vitamin A whatsoever. They don't receive vitamin C either. They receive about 53% of their daily um, um, content or requirements of iron and 32% of niacin. And that's a big problem. So then again, if you look at um, other micronutrients such as iodine, zinc, iron, calcium, um, folate, vitamin B12, you do have a little bit. If you look at milk, um, there's a, there is vitamin A, as mentioned previously. There's a little bit of vitamin A in meat, fish, and poultry. There's vitamin A in eggs. But if you looked at refined cereals, sugars, and oils, which is what refugees typically receive, there's no vitamin A. There's vitamin A in fruits and vegetables, but no vitamin A in beans and peanuts. So what are the dietary sources of vitamin A? I mentioned liver earlier. There's a lot of vitamin A in liver, um, milk, eggs, fruits, 
um, but also in breast milk. But thinking about these populations that you know that were that we actually um, treat and that we, that, we, that we actually take care of refugees, individuals living in developing countries, very few of them have access to to milk, have access to eggs. Um, I don't think they have access to, to liver from um, various animals. They don't have access to fruits. And as mentioned earlier, breastfeeding prevalence tends, um, tends to be extremely low. So thinking about just dietary sources of vitamin A, we know that refugees and individuals living in poor countries do not have access to dietary sources of vitamin A. I'm going to move on to um, the, clinical, the clinical diagnosis of vitamin A deficiency. So typically, so you can actually um, measure um, retinal levels. We, we um, said in the beginning that vitamin, vitamin A deficiency is characterized by serum retinal levels that are less than 20 micrograms um, per deciliter. So is it possible to actually measure serum retinal levels? Um, in refugee camps or in developing countries? And, and the answer to that is no. It's very difficult to do that. The vitamin A deficiency is typically a clinical diagnosis. Unfortunately, um, people manifest signs of vitamin A deficiency very late. And so when you actually, when you're able to see, physically see signs of vitamin A deficiency, it's um, usually too late. Um, and we know that it's reversible, and you want to be able to diagnose early so that you can actually reverse vitamin A deficiency. Unfortunately, it's very, very difficult because measuring serum retinal levels is hard um, in certain conditions. Um, serum, ker serum keratin levels also correlate with vitamin, vitamin A levels and is used as a surrogate marker, marker. But again, these biochemical tests are extremely difficult to access in, in poor countries and refugee camps. So let's talk about um, other clinical manifestations, I mean concrete um, clinical manifestations. And the major um, clinical manifestation of vitamin A deficiency is an ocular condition. Um, so xerophthalmia is actually defined by a spectrum of eye disease. And I'll go into more detail um, soon, but um, usually it's manifested as blindness. So individuals that are blind. Um, can have vitamin A deficiency. Um, obviously, there are other causes of blindness, but um, when you're looking at countries, countries that we um, specified in that map, when you have blindness and you have um, a country where the, um, the prevalence of vitamin A deficiency is pretty high, you want to think of um, vitamin A deficiency as being a cause um, of blindness. Growth retardation is another clinical manifestation. You have poor bone growth. Um, so in addition to other causes of malnutrition, um, so thinking about stunting, protein energy um, deficiencies, vitamin A deficiency can also cause growth retardation. Another clinical manifestation is decreased immunity. You have a decrease in your humoral and cell-mediated immune response. And this, therefore, can lead to a whole spectrum of conditions, and I'll talk about that as well. As a result of decreased immunity, you have increased severity of infectious morbidity, um, leading to increased vulnerability to these three conditions, measles, diarrhea, um, upper and lower respiratory infections. You also have the exacerbation of iron deficiency anemia. And when you think about all these things, the decreased immunity, increased severity of infectious morbidity, measles, diarrhea, upper and lower respiratory illnesses, um, iron deficiency anemia, that those conditions as a whole can lead to increased mortality. So there's a whole spectrum of um, vitamin A deficiency disorders. And um, there's something called the hierarchical model that was developed by Keith West, um, who's also um, at, at Johns Hopkins. And he basically defined this as follows. You have um, chronic dietary deficiency. Um, in countries that where vitamin A deficiency is endemic. But then you, you can have um, tissue and plasma depletion of vitamin A, um, and that's manifested in measles, um, in individuals that have decreased access to um, foods that have um, vitamin A. Um, and as a result, you get systemic effects such as anemia, 
poor growth and herd immunity, as we talked about in the previous slide. And with all these things, your mortality risk goes up. Um, at the um, tip of this um, triangle here, you have xerophthalmia, which is the um, eye condition, the spectrum of the eye conditions um, that I spoke about, but also corneal blindness. And once you actually reach the tip of this triangle, once you have corneal blindness, it's, very, it's irreversible. So you want to target individuals that are here, that have chronic dietary deficiency, um, to resolve um, vitamin A deficiency. So what is xerophthalmia? So in um, Greek, it comes from the Greek, xerosis means dry, and ophthalmia means eye or an inflamed eye. Um, and that's what it's defined as, dry eye or inflamed eye. But it, um, its definition is the ocular manifestation of vitamin A deficiency is characterized by either night blindness, the toe spots, which are various gradients of this eye condition. and um, as mentioned in the previous slide, at the tip of that triangle was corneal blindness. You get scarring in, in your corneas. Um, and that's completely irreversible. So night blindness and bateau spots are conditions that are reversible by vitamin A supplementation. And so you don't want to have a late severe manifestation of vitamin A, a deficiency characterized by corneal blindness. Unfortunately, it's estimated that 10 million school children and pregnant women develop um, potentially blinding xerophthalmia each year in the world. This is a huge problem among pregnant women. Um, pregnant women in countries that um, have increased vitamin E deficiency um, have um, night blindness. And um, the night blindness occurs during pregnancy. And it's associated with increased risk of maternal anemia, morbidity, and mortality. And we know that with increased risk of maternal anemia, you have um, increased risk of infant mortality, as well as um, low birth weight, um, and so those are things to think about. So vitamin A deficiency is not an island on, it, um, on its own. Um, it comes with increased risk of anemia, other conditions, but also increased morbidity and mortality, especially among pregnant women. So there was a randomized control trial that was done in Nepal that demonstrated that, a decrease, that there was a decrease of approximately 44% in mortality related to pregnancy following continuous um, weekly receipt of vitamin A or beta carotene. And it's usually manifest in the third trimester, but as mentioned, can be reversal, this is very important, typically two to four weeks after delivery. So again, we talked about those three conditions, so respiratory illness, diarrhea, and measles. Um, and individuals, especially children with vitamin A deficiency, are at increased risk for contracting diarrhea, measles, and respiratory illness. And we know that these are the leading causes of death among children under five in low and middle income countries. Um, there was a recent meta analysis that showed that vitamin A supplementation is associated with um, a 28% reduction in deaths from diarrhea, 15% reduction in the incidence of diarrhea, 50% reduction in the incidence of measles. So in addition to providing um, you know, typical measures such as providing oral rehydration solution for diarrhea, um, you know, treating measles, you want to, or vaccinating against measles, you want to think about vitamin A deficiency because we know that um, by um, supplementing vitamin A, you can actually, um, it leads to a reduction in, in deaths from, from these conditions. So on the right here is a picture of a young boy whose name is Edwardson. Um, I met him in Haiti. He lived in one of the um, shelter communities that SP built um, after the earthquake. It was very close to the, the GO base. And he actually had corneal blindness or has corneal blindness as a result of vitamin A deficiency. Um, it has affected the way he lives. He's unable to go to school. Um, he's unable to lead a normal life as a result of this. Um, it's interesting because neither of his siblings have vitamin A deficiency. He's the only one. Um, a couple of people that worked um, for SP got together and tried to help him get a corneal transplant. He was able to receive the transplant, um, but it, it failed. Um, 
a couple of weeks after because of poor sanitary conditions. Um, and his life is going to be affected basically forever by this by this condition. He's not going to be able to work. Um, and it's something that's easily preventable. If he had received vitamin A um, as a younger child, he would not have had um, he would not have had um, corneal blindness. So if you look at um, the eyes of individuals with corneal blindness, you see scarring in the cornea. And I'm going to show another picture. So this is an individual child who has bilateral corneal scars. And by the time you have these scars, it's um, irreversible. So what is the evidence um, to actually do vitamin A distribution or supplementation? Um, and why is it important? Um, we talked about um, the fact that vitamin A does lead to increased morbidity and mortality in um, children and pregnant women. And so um, there have been multiple trials that have been done um, that actually show that vitamin A supplementation leads to decreased mortality. I'm going to talk about these trials. Um, but reduction of vitamin A deficiency has become um, very important um, in the public health world for the reasons um, that we discussed. But it is now in the Declaration of the Rights of the Child. Um, every child should be able to receive vitamin A. Um, it's also embedded in the Millennium Development Goals. Um, you know, there are five Millennium Development Goals. And um, goal number one is reduction of hunger. Goal number four is reduction of child mortality. I should have also included goal number five, which is reduction of uh, maternal mortality. Um, as a result of vitamin A supplementation, we know that um, there is definitely a reduction in mortality. And therefore, um, it's um, considered to be part of the Millennium Development Goals um, indirectly. So UNICEF and WHO have led this large campaign to provide vitamin A to these target groups, um, pregnant women and children. And um, they found that the ideal way to actually distribute vitamin A is to include it within vaccination campaigns. Um, we know that um, you know, there are certain vaccinations that are given to, um, to children. And um, as they're the regular schedules, and so um, if you're able to distribute vitamin A um, in conjunction with immunization, um, we know that um, these target groups, um, especially children, um, will be receiving the vitamin A dose that they need. So there are, there are various methods or strategies um, that um, can be used to increase um, vitamin A levels. Um, and they're, they're the following. Um, diet is one. Um, so dietary diversity, um, and that, that remains a problem for the reasons that we um, mentioned earlier in the presentation. Um, access to food is an issue. Um, when you're dealing with emergencies, humanitarian emergencies, um, you have disruption of local systems, disruption of local markets. People don't have access to land um, to actually grow certain foods. Um, they, they just don't have access to um, to foods that actually contain high levels of vitamin A, such as milk and eggs. It's difficult to store when you don't have electricity is another issue. Um, fortification is another, is another strategy. Um, if you're able to provide food rations that have increased vitamin A levels, that's, that's the solution. Or to actually introduce certain foods that have high levels of vitamin A. There was a, an article in NPR several months ago that was talking about um, fortified rice with vitamin A. But that becomes a problem when um, certain countries are not used to eating um, a certain type of food and you're introducing this um, food um, to their culture and they might not be very receptive. That's, that's um, something to think about as you're thinking about strategies to increase vitamin A. And supplementation is the third, um, is the third strategy, just providing vitamin A capsules. And you are currently the only person in this conference. Cost um, about two cents, two cents a dose. So these slides I got from UNICEF, looking at um, vitamin A distribution, um, or the number of children that receive at least one dose of vitamin A in various um, parts of the world. If you look at East um, Asia, comparing 1999 to 2009, um, the, the percentage of children that have received vitamin A has increased significantly from 65 to 81%. 
in Sub-Saharan Africa has remained about the same, um, 70 to 73%. In South, South Asia, Southeast Asia, it has um, increased significantly from 35 to 62%. So overall, um, if you look at least developed countries and developing countries, um, unfortunately, in the least developed countries, um, vitamin A distribution has decreased from 80% to 75%. Um, in developing countries, it's increased from 50 um, to 68 percent. So that's pretty significant. And as mentioned, um, vitamin A is being delivered through campaign style events in most of the countries that were surveyed by, by UNICEF. Um, so the majority of um, campaigns or strategies um, used um, in terms of vitamin A distribution um, is actually via polio national immunization day. So 26 percent of all campaigns um, is, I think Kelly is making a comment here, the World Food um, Basket should include fortified oil. I don't know if this is 100% compliant. She provided a link. That's, that's a good point, Kelly. I think um, fortification of food rations would be extremely important um, because as mentioned in um, previous slides, um, the vitamin A content in food rations is basically zero. So fortifying oil would be a good would be a good strategy. So other other strategies are child health days. So twenty three percent of vitamin A distribution is done via child health days. Um, so fixed sites, meaning clinics, um, other communities such as churches, um, schools. Um, so vitamin A distribution is done. Is done that way in about 17% of cases. So if you combine both um, six sites and outreach, it's about 14%. And micronutrient events is about 15%. The measles supplementary immunization activity is only 5%. And that's that's a that's a huge problem because um, I'm going to talk about measles and, and vitamin A deficiency and um, how vitamin A deficiency can increase morbidity and mortality in measles. Any questions so far? Hi. No questions? I'll oh, go ahead. On the, um, the thing you were talking about the distribution, <laughs> you know, that happens in emergency is by and, and then it looks like Kelly's saying it should be, like the oil should be fortified. Is that just not true? So it, it actually depends um, on who's providing. Um, so the majority of WFP um, food rations, um, if you look at the earlier slides, sometimes they don't have vitamin A, um, fortified oil with vitamin A. Um, it's, it's a costly intervention to fortify um, certain foods with vitamin A is costly. Um, and so when you're actually deciding what type of ration you're going to be distributing, and I'm, and I'm not an expert on this, um, that should be taken into consideration. So the reason why we said um, vitamin A deficiency is a problem during humanitarian emergencies is because, first of all, it's usually endemic. So they already have chronic um, deficiency. It looks like audio is gone. Oh, you're good. Um, for those okay. of you that are having audio issues, the uh, conference call today is a much better option. We're having some bandwidth connection issues. So if you can dial in on the conference call, that would be a much better audio option for you. Okay. So I'll, I'll continue. Um, so they already have, at baseline, there's already a high prevalence of vitamin A deficiency. But then as you have your emergency, you're, you have disruption of um, systems, um, of the infrastructure, people don't have access to food, if there's a war, if there's conflict, um, you know, that disrupts local markets. And so you think about all these things that in addition to just having chronic vitamin A deficiency at baseline that can cause an increase in your vitamin A deficiency levels. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's really helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. So this was probably considered one of the most important trials um, that provided evidence as to why vitamin A um, supplementation is extremely important. It was done by um, Alfred Stomer, who's right here, who's an ophthalmologist, um, again, at, at Hopkins. And he 
and his group conducted a large randomized control trial in um, Aceh in Bangladesh um, from 1982 to 1984. Um, and they basically were able to randomize um, vitamin A, high levels of vitamin A, so 200,000 international units of vitamin A versus placebo to 450 villages um, every six months. And they found that um, vitamin A reduced uh, mortality by 34%. And that was the first um, trial that demonstrated that vitamin A does um, reduce mortality. And as a result of this, um, this changed um, public health policy regarding vitamin A supplementation. There were a lot of people, interestingly enough, that were opposed to um, giving such high doses of vitamin A because they were worried about toxicity. Um, but he demonstrated that um, by giving vitamin A, there was a clear reduction by 34%. And there were several other trials that um, subsequently followed. Um, and these trials done in other countries. I'm sorry, I said Aceh was in um, Bangladesh. It's actually in Indonesia. Um, so other trials done in other countries, such, such as India, Nepal, and Africa, showed that, um, so here there was a reduction um, in mortality by 45%. In India, the reduction in mortality was 54%. Here there's only a reduction by 6%, and it's not clear why that is. Um, but if you look at the range, it's, uh, it was typically from as low as 6 to 54 percent. It's not clear why it was lower in these countries. Interestingly enough, in um, Africa, trials done in both Sudan and Ghana, um, so in Ghana there was a reduction by 19 percent, um, and in Sudan it was only 6 percent. Um, there's actually, sorry, there was an increase in mortality in Sudan, and it's not clear why why that, that was. By, but um, if you look at the majority of trials overall that, that were conducted, um, there's a clear indication that there is a reduction in, vitamin, in mortality when you distribute um, vitamin A. And when I say distribute vitamin A, it's usually at a high dose, so 200,000 international units. So as a result of these studies, as a result of um, these campaigns, especially the campaign led by Alfred Zomer, um, he did a lot of work with WHO to push um, various ministries of health and other countries to implement vitamin A supplementation as part of a national public health policy. Um, as a result, um, there have been guidelines that have been established. Um, so for children that are zero to six months, usually you don't give vitamin A. Um, you give, you recommend breastfeeding and you actually give um, the vitamin A to the mother postpartum. Um, so to the mother, you can give it, um, give vitamin A to her as a single dose of 200,000 units within six to eight weeks of, after delivery, or you can give her 10,000 units daily or 25,000 units weekly during the first six months after delivery. And this ensures that um, children that are zero to six months will receive adequate vitamin A. So for those that are 6 to 11 months, you give um, vitamin A as a single dose, um, as 100,000 units. And this is typically done at any health or immunization contact, such as measles immunization. So for children that are 12 to 59 months, so one to um, about five years old, they receive um, vitamin A as a single dose of 200,000 international units every four to six months. And again, this is at any health or immunization contact. And I'm going to talk about measles. I mentioned measles earlier. Um, unfortunately, 80% um, of all pediatric cases of blindness in Africa among children that have measles is caused by vitamin A deficiency. Um, so measles leads to a decrease in serum retinal levels. You have, you have um, extreme levels of vitamin A deficiency. So imagine, you know, remember the triangle that I talked about. You already have chronic dietary um, deficiencies in vitamin A. So then you have a measles outbreak in a refugee camp, for example. So this is going to lead to further, a further decrease in serum retinal levels. Um, and as a result, you can have um, corneal destruction. Um, as a result of um, vitamin A deficiency. So WHO and UNICEF um, has issued this um, statement. 
So in order to reduce measles mortality in emergencies, not only do you get measles immunization, but you also get vitamin A supplementation, and that's a priority health intervention during and after emergencies. So for those of you working in refugee camps or responding to um, humanitarian emergencies, you want to think about measles and vitamin A supplementation. Um, and, I, and now I think um, the current recommendation is to give two doses of measles immunization, and with that, you must also give vitamin A. It's very, very important because, as mentioned, you have decreased vitamin A levels. And so vitamin A supplementation actually reduces the incidence of measles complications. Um, so we talked about the corneal um, complications. So as you're giving vitamin A, you actually, you're actually reducing the risk for developing complications as a result of measles. You must cover every child that's six months to five years old. So for measles immunization, I know the recommendation is for um, in individuals that are up to 15, um, but those that are extremely important are those that are six months to five years old for the reasons stated above. So they're at increased risk for mortality as a result of measles. So I want to conclude. Um, I hope I convinced you that vitamin A supplementation is extremely important. It's a low-cost, high-yield intervention. It's less than four cents a dose, so it doesn't cost very much. Um, leads to 30% reduction in all-cause mortality. Um, and as you're thinking about these interventions, you want to target children and women, especially uh, displaced populations of refugees. Um, you know, remember vitamin A is the leading cause of preventable blindness in the world. and um, I was thinking about my little friend Edwards, and if he had received vitamin A when he was younger, he would not have been blind. Um, and it's such a cheap intervention. Um, it's, it's a shame that it's not being done, done, done everywhere. Um, and I wanted to just have a little discussion um, to end. We have about 20 more minutes. So which strategy do you think is the most cost-effective and sustainable for treatment of vitamin A deficiency? Do you think it's supplementation? Do you think it's worth continuing to have campaigns where you um, provide vitamin A supplements during measles immunizations at health clinics? Do you think fortification is something that should be um, invested in? Um, or do you think that dietary diversity, increasing dietary diversity, is something that is sustainable, cost-effective, and, and possible? Why do you say that? Well, I think dietary diversity would very, be very difficult to achieve in some populations. Mm -hmm. um, and the same with fortification, just having the, the ability to have um, consistency in that. Is that sustainable or not? I don't know. Great. Any, anybody else who wants to be an open discussion? international units as a single dose 
Um, how long do we know how long serum retinol levels uh, stay uh, high with a single dose? Yeah, so it's actually four to six months, which is why um, the recommendation is to do it every four to six months. Okay. And Kelly has written in that uh, we did it in Sudan as part of our nutrition programs uh, and the MCH program. And all the MCH clinics in Haiti, as they pointed out uh, as well. Does anybody know about the other um, health programs that Samaritan's Purse runs? Um. <laughs> No. People type in, I think Mary Lou is maybe contributing to the conversation. It looks like she's typing something and she may have some insight. Okay. With some of the robots while we're waiting for Mary Lou to finish, um, Kelly's asking if there's a risk of immediate toxicity with some Q4 month dosing. And there actually isn't. Um, so um, the half I can't remember what the half life is, but. Um, you know, there, there was a lot of controversy about giving high dose vitamin A. People were worried about toxicity, but it actually has been demonstrated that there's decreased mortality and not mortality associated with um, this toxicity. I don't know if that answers your question, Kelly. Do we have any other questions? Mary Lou was typing something. Yeah, I was going to say um, we have done we have done uh, uh, vitamin A supplementation when we've worked with other ministries of health in doing their immunization campaigns, and I'd have to probably look up which countries. But yes, we have done done it in other countries. A couple of points, uh, Linda. Thank you. That was really good. Um, a few. I'm on a list serve that a few months ago. Some person brings up the fact that vitamin A supplementation for kids who don't need it can have a negative effect. And it sounds like if there's no toxic uh, problems, then I I'm not sure what that person was talking about. So I wanted to ask you about that. And the second question is, if uh, would, would vitamin A uh, supplementation not help children over five years of age also? Hey, so you weren't able to hear Mary this question for you by any chance? No. Okay. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're the same city. <laughs> Uh, Mary Lou, I'm sorry. We're having some technical problems where the telephone's not connecting with the actual computer. Uh, would you mind typing a, a, just a real brief synopsis so that we have it captured on the recording of the session? But would you mind just typing that in so Linda could answer those questions for you and see that? I apologize, but we're having just some technical problems related to the equipment today.
but I, I'm assuming it's probably a lot more expensive than four cents a dose. Yeah. And you know what I wonder if there are you know, indirect costs associated with um, distribution because you're not just providing vitamin A capsules, you're also hiring people, paying for transportation, you know, to set up um, to do this intervention. And I wonder if you looked at the total costs, um, if that would go up. But that's a great question. And I think supplementation is probably is still the cheapest way to um, reverse vitamin A deficiency. Um, but fortification would seem like a great a great way to um, to deal with everything because it's you don't have to do campaigns all the time. You're just providing foods that already have vitamin A incorporated in them. Linda Kelly has a question. Sure. So she's asking. Um, about how vitamin A is absorbed, and it's usually absorbed. I can go back to that slide. It's way in the beginning. Bear with me. Okay. So there are um, there are precursors to vitamin A, and they're usually in the form of provitamin A beta carotene, and it's absorbed in the gut and um, actually stored in the liver. Um, the details about um, the process by which it actually gets processed from um, provitamin A, beta carotene to vitamin A, um, I'm not very familiar um, about the, the entire process that's entailed, um, but I do know that um, because um, if, if it's only absorbed or if it's only provided um, in fruits and vegetables, you actually only receive, um, you end up receiving one-sixth of all the vitamin A content that's um, in the um, nutrient or the food that you're that you're eating. Any any other questions? I know we're almost done. We're almost out of time. Yes. So Kelly's asking if um, pre vitamin E is not converted to all we've got. Um, and she, she has a good point that like, you don't always depend on um, pre-vitamin A that's in the form of fruits and vegetables. We get direct vitamin A from supplements. Are you, are you saying it's just from supplements or are you saying it's from another, from another source? Because the major sources are fruits, vegetables, eggs, milk, and liver. Can you clarify your, your question, Kelly? Linda, this has been a very informative and interesting discussion and presentation. I want to thank you on behalf of the Samaritan's Person International Health Forum. Um, we're very grateful um, for your expertise today, and I want to thank everyone that has joined us today. And sorry for the technical difficulties that we have, but um, we're really uh, glad that each of you could join us. Thank and you so much for letting me speak. Thank you. I hope you all have a great day. Bye. Bye.